Well, as uh, Don already mentioned in the welcome, this is kind of an exciting time over the next few weeks. Exciting, scary in some ways. It's a challenge for us to walk out in faith. So just so you know, over the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about the theme of building together. And after a lot of prayer, we're going to talk about this a little bit more later during this lesson. The elders felt like God was calling us at this time to renovate this auditorium. And, And I remember when I first got here, there were some stains and someone said, well, you can't clean those stains because... It would rip the carpet up, and we can't match 35-year-old stained carpet. And so I said, okay. And we got these great little tracks right here. I, they've been here for a long time right there. I guess some tape was there once. If y'all, I don't know if y'all noticed, but when I read my Bible, I have to come right over here. Y'all are going to notice this from now on just to find light, because there isn't any light right here. And I'm too old to read dark letters anymore. And we're going to uh, get new video projectors, and that's coming really soon. Tell you more about that later. But it's time. In fact, after worship service, you're going to get a brochure, and there will be ushers that will be handing these out as you leave. And it tells you what we're going to do, it, why we're doing it. And there's some frequently asked questions in here with answers from the elders that, that will help you. But also... Make sure and come to some of these snack gatherings so we can talk to you in person about this. And of course, not only are we doing the auditorium, but we're praying that God will give us enough money to put a youth center right here so we can get them out of that old building, a youth center that will have room for classes and activities. And why are we doing this? Well, believe it or not, it's posted right here on this wall. It says, living like Jesus by loving and serving all. We believe that this is going to help us do the work of Jesus in our community and in our midst. And I don't want you to be mistaken about one thing. Our number one goal is to be more like Jesus. Not to build a building, not to look pretty to others, but to figure out how we can best serve Jesus Christ with our lives, be more like him and to reach others. And in fact, in Peter, and if you have your Bibles, turn to First Peter, we'll be their son this morning. And verse 1 through 3 says this. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. That by it you may grow up into salvation. So our hope is to become more spiritual. That's our hope. Our hope is to grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a few things we have to put away. He says, put away malice. Don't wish to anyone else harm. That's not within the spirit of Christ. Put away deceit and hypocrisy. You know, we're, we're called to live like Jesus. That means that what we think, what our heart wants, that what our actions actually do need to all be in line with what we say and in line with our desire to follow Jesus Christ. That's a pretty tall order because Satan is always putting pressure on us from every side to try and drag us away from Jesus. But we need to get rid of any sort of deceit in our life. We need to say what we mean and follow through with it and bring our life in line with Jesus Christ and get rid of envy and all slander. And basically what he's telling us is, is we need to make sure that what we want most in life, what we realize we need most in life is Jesus above all else. That's what we need to realize. And as we start off this series on building together, we want that to be the foundation. In James chapter 1, it says, talking about someone that, that wants something for their life, it says, but let him ask God in faith. With no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and knocked around by the winds. And that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from God. Now, what's he saying here? He's saying, 
We need to turn to God for our needs, but we need to do it in faith. Faith that God is the one who will provide for our needs. Faith that God is the one that's directing our life. In James 4, he says, you have not because you ask not. And then he goes on in the next verse and says, or when you ask, you're asking with the wrong motives to spend on your own desires. And we've learned this as Christians, haven't we? That this need to die to self is paramount in our desire to connect with God. So as we launch this series, let's make no mistake about it, that our desire is to be more like Jesus, to become more spiritual, to build our lives on him. And anything we do, we hope will help us with that purpose in our lives. I want to give you a little update. Um, Last week, for those of you that were here for Easter service, you got to see the video of my friend Rob Brown, who used to be a missionary in uh, Barnaul, Russia, in Siberia. And I met him there when he was a young man, and, and, uh, and I was about 13 years older than him at the time. And, and his wife has been fighting cancer for a couple years. And in that video, you heard him say that they finally realized that, that she can't fight anymore that she wasn't going to continue the treatments and that she knew the time was near. And so Tuesday, while I was in an elders and deacons and ministers meeting, I got this text from Rob. He said at 6.40 p.m., please join with me and hosts of others who we have asked to pray that Tracy crosses the finish line soon, very soon, and is welcomed into the arms of Jesus tonight, now, please, Father. So I didn't share that with them at the time. We were talking about other things, and but I went home and prayed for that. And I went to bed at 10.30 and woke up the next morning at 11 p.m. He sent me this message. No more. No more labs. No more pain. No more cancer. No more waiting. No more ICC trips in the middle of the night. No more drugs. No more of those things that pained us most this last season of life. Tracy is home with her king, wrapped in the arms of her Jesus. Tracy is free. Tracy is home. Thank you, loving father. Wow. You know, when I, we were singing that song, No More Fear, you know, I don't have to have fear of death because my life is rooted in Jesus Christ. I know I'm going to go. I just don't know when. But I know until I do, I want to do the best job I can on this earth of being who God wants me to be. And that's what we want to do as a church. We want to build your faith so you won't have fear. So you'll be ready to go. So you'll know you have a rock solid foundation in Jesus. And that's what we're about. And so he says right here, beginning in verse 4, he continues on. What does it mean to grow up into salvation through pure spiritual milk? Here's what he says. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men. And in verse 6, he's going to tell us that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone that was prophesied about in the Old Testament. The one that he was going to build his plan on, build his church on. That's who Jesus is. The one that we can build our lives on that foundation. He says it's going to be rejected by men. But as we come to Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of God's plan, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. So we are living stones in this sense, in this illustration. And as living stones, beings with a mind and thoughts and emotions and desires made in the image of God. We're being built on the living stone, Jesus Christ. And we're being built together, interconnected into a spiritual house. We're connected to God through Jesus. We're connected to each other through our faith. And it's the way that God meant for us to live. And how are you built up? Well, one of the ways you're built up is you immerse yourself in the Word of God. One of the ways that you're built up is is you come to church and you study the Bible and you worship together and we together encourage each other through accountability relationships. You know, I used to hear about accountability relationships. I hardly ever hear about them anymore, but who challenges you in the Lord? 
We're in a society that doesn't like to be challenged. We're in a society where everyone thinks they know everything they need and wants to do it themselves by themselves. We're a very individualistic society, but it's not the way that God intended for us to grow. In, intended for us to grow by by locking arms with each other and going together somewhere. And that way we can make up for each other's strengths and weaknesses. We're intended to be a body. And in fact, in this vision, and I've noticed that more of you have gotten it over the the past few weeks, one of the things we say, one of our first initiatives is deepen our spiritual relationships. Why is that? Because if we're growing together as a spiritual house, we have to be deeply connected to God, our Father. We have to be deeply connected through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and we have to be deeply connected to each other It's a spiritual relationship that we're trying to build here. So we are a spiritual house. We aren't brick and mortar. We aren't carpets and pews or lights. We're we're this spiritual being that God built together into his church or his house. So that's God's plan. So not only are we a spiritual house, but he goes on to tell us that we have a spiritual purpose. And he says, he says, so let's read it again. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We have a purpose that's beyond ourselves. Your purpose isn't just to go out there and take care of your family and earn a living and make enough money to enroll your kids in recreational leagues and to go on a vacation. You have a much deeper purpose than that. If that's the extent of your purpose, when the day of death comes, you will be fearful because you'll realize there wasn't any depth or meat or substance to your life. God intends for us to live like Jesus by loving and serving all. That's, by the way, why this church so generously at times will collect coats to give to those in need. That's why we as a church will oftentimes generously collect toys for kids that have none. It's why we enjoy putting together boxes of food to take to places where they have less food. Or care packages. It's why for many years we worked at Kumo. And as that slowly kind of died down, now we're looking to extend those same sort of efforts into Withamsville, Tabasco Elementary right down the road. That's why we're hoping to do a Thanksgiving meal there at the school this next Thanksgiving. Because we know that we should be living like Jesus by loving and serving all. But it's not just caring about their needs. He goes on in verse 9 and 10 and says, But you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are called to declare the glory of God to others. There's, it's no accident that when we sat down and prayed about where God was leading us and how we could flesh this out in our church and our lives, that the very next point after deep in our spiritual relationships, which is number one, we grow close to God and each other, was reach the lost. It's the very next point. And it's no accident that the third point right after this is promote a culture of hospitality. We've been talking a lot about that and we'll continue to do it because you don't reach the lost if you don't open up your lives to other people. That's what we've been talking about. The church doesn't assimilate the lost. You are the church. We assimilate the lost. And we've been talking about that. That's why... For many years, you all supported uh, Jason Moore's efforts in Panama to build a church there in a medical clinic. That's why now, as a church, we are supporting the effort in Boa Vista, Brazil, and only three of us have been there so far, and it's in the middle of nowhere. It's not easy to get to either, believe me. But there's people there that are lost, that are very receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we want to be involved in that. 
That's why we had the AIM group come last Sunday because we wanted you to see that it's important to instill that sort of sense of mission in our kids. There is nothing that you can do that is better than instilling a sense of mission in your kids or preparing them for the world that they're going to face. And there's a lot of ways to do it, but AIM is one of those ways. We want as a church to reach the lost. And, and so to do that, we have to be connected to God. We have to learn and mature ourselves so we're ready to be the type of person that lives like Jesus by serving others and loving and sharing the gospel with them. Now, how do you think that happens? Or, or better, where do you think that happens? Well, some of it, to pass on the faith, to encourage each other. That's where this is. In Hebrews, it says in 10, 24 through 25, and let us consider how to spur one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting the habit of meeting together as some of you are doing, but encourage each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. The writer of Hebrews says, Christians, it's important that we encourage and spur each other to grow into Jesus Christ, to grow into his life and our life, but we can't do that if we don't meet together. It's always been God's plan that we do it by meeting together. And if you look at the Bible and, and Acts, the Jerusalem church, that early church, they met in homes. If you look at Corinth, it's pretty obvious to, to most scholars that there were probably several house churches in the city of Corinth. Scholars think that in Romans that Paul is addressing, especially in chapter 16, probably about five different house churches. You have to meet somewhere to carry on the work of the Lord. That's why we have this building and we meet here. Now, as they grew out of houses, and by the way, some people, I don't know why, they get the idea that the form is more important than the function. So some people think you can't have a real church if you don't meet in a house. Well, I don't think that... That was God's intention because what happened is the church grew and they weren't being persecuted anymore. They started building bigger places and they, they would buy a house instead of meeting in someone's home. They bought the house and dedicated it as the meeting place for the church is what they did. And so some of the earliest churches we know of, they found the archaeological remains of a church that was dated 240 AD. One of the earliest ones we've seen, that house was purchased and made a church. No one lived there. It was for a church. Now, as the church grew even more, they built buildings specifically made to be a church. Why? Because God's people has to come somewhere and meet. Now, I know some people that have this Philosophy, and I think they're well-intentioned, and God bless you if you think that way. I, I have family that thinks this way, that we should only give money to people and the work of the Lord, not the church. Well, if that was the case, we'd all still meet, be meeting down there in the fellowship center. No, if that was the case, we'd be meeting in that little white frame building that was torn down years ago that'd be probably 130, 100 and something years old that was a few blocks down the road. If that was the case, there would have never been house churches that were dedicated just to the Lord. There would have never been the early churches. Here's the reality is that as you grow as a church, you need a place to meet. And this is our place to meet. It's where we love each other and train each other. And it says, by the way, now you are the body of Christ and individually in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, members of it. We're members of this body and this is where we meet. And... This church, without replacing these video projectors and working on these lights and changing out this carpet, isn't going to make it 30 more years. It's just not going to do it. But it made it over 30 years, about 30 years already. And so we believe that it's time to ensure the work of God in this location for 30 more years. It's not because we want a pretty place to meet. We want a place that will last 30 more years so we can keep doing the great things that God's been doing during all this time. Now, the question is, when is the time to do it? Now, there's an advantage, by the way, to meeting in a group like this. You could go meet in little homes, and there's some advantages to meeting in little homes. I always say meet in a home during the week and come to the big gathering 
on Sunday. But if you meet in a little home, you can't afford a children's minister to do special trainings for your children. You can't afford a youth minister to do some special training for the youth. You can't afford a a Mike Goley to come and work with the Mike Singer so we can have a great worship. And I don't think there's anything wrong by that. In fact, I think God is glorified by that. But you can't do it without a proper facility. Now, the question is, is, is it the right time? So someone recently quoted Emerson and he said, this time, like all the times, is a very good one. If we but know what to do with it. You know, so the question is, is when is the right time to do this? That's the question. When would God want us to do it? I don't think anybody would disagree that, that we got to replace these when they go out. And trust me, it's a miracle. I think it's just because Mike prays every Thursday that these video projectors haven't gone out yet. And that one over there is always a little fuzzy. I naturally want to look over there, but over there I can actually read the word. So it's a, kind of tough to know which, which way to look. And you know, the elders have spent a lot of time praying about this and believe that this is the time that God's calling us to. I want you to watch this video from a few members of our church. My name is Alan Cornett. Uh, my wife, Melinda, and our two sons, AJ and Andy, we've been attending with them still for about seven months now. Uh, and so some things we just love about this church, number one being the hospitality, uh, which has been incredible since day one, and that continues. Uh, number two uh, is the rocks group and the youth group. Uh, those programs are great for our kids. Uh, and number three, it's just, it's just great seeing the, uh, the focus on missions as well. Uh, very encouraging to be part of a church that is focused on what Jesus wanted for us. Hello, my name is Tristan, and something that I love about Withamsville is the tight-knit community that the youth group has formed. My name is Watson, and my favorite thing about this church is how friendly everyone is. I'm Sarah Gillespie. What I love about Withamsville is the children. The children are amazing here. And the activities that they do with children, I've never seen a church that is so outpouring to the children. I personally love all of the kids here. (laughs) Woohoo! Go church! You know, why now? It's hard sometimes to know when and what God is calling us to do. I I think of Acts chapter 16, 6 through 10, and Paul's on his missionary journey, and and he goes through Phrygia and Galatia, and and he wants to go into Asia, but it says right there that the Holy Spirit prevented him from doing it. So that's fine. He went on down to uh, Mysia, and, and then it said Paul wanted to go to Bithynia, but it says that the Spirit of Jesus Christ prevented him from doing it. Then he went to bed that night and he had this dream and there was a man from Macedonia saying, come on over here to Macedonia and help us. And that led to establishment of the church in Macedonia. What a great ministry effort that was because Paul listened to the calling of the Holy Spirit. Well, why have the elders decided now is the time to do this? Well, I want to tell you one of the reasons why is because the elders, and we've heard confirmation from you, see that God is working in this church. God is stirring up faith. God is bringing in the lost. God is bringing in new people. There's a stirring going on in this church that only could be by the Holy Spirit. And we see in you the the spirit of generosity, the spirit of love of others. We see the hospitality growing among you. And and there's something that God's doing that, that just doesn't, you can't just make it happen. You think you can, but if you've lived long enough in the church, you realize that You don't control that. God does. And when it happens, it's a blessing that comes from him and him only. A lot of things come together, but it comes from God and God only. And and a lot of churches don't have that and haven't had that, especially after COVID. Most churches are going shrinking in numbers. God is growing our church in numbers. And not only that, but we have a great opportunity. I mean, you go out here and there's thousands of cars going back and forth every day. In fact, the population in this area is growing, not shrinking. We have a better opportunity than we ever had before to reach many people around us. By the way, one of the things that we're going to do this summer, get ready for it, we're excited about it, 
is we're going to meet here on a Wednesday night in July before our community picnic at Veterans Park. And we're going to do a training. And on Saturday, we're going to go to the neighborhoods around this church building and the neighborhood around WT Elementary. And we're going to knock doors and invite people to our community picnic because we think God is calling us to reach the lost. There is a great opportunity around us that we have the opportunity to be involved in. And not only that, but God has blessed us financially. Now, maybe you're just starting out in your career or life and and you're already tithing and giving as generously as you can. Well, then God bless you. Keep doing that. Keep supporting the work. We need people to keep supporting what we're doing here. But many of us have been blessed beyond what we need. And, And that is a calling from God to be more generous with his work. And some people... About 30 years ago, 31 or two years ago, this church came together and they felt like God was saying it was the time. I talked to Richard DePoy about it, by the way. And uh, he's the one that, that has the best memory. I think he's, as far as I know, been here about as long as anybody. But he says, yeah, it was interesting when we started talking about building this building, not everybody was in favor of it. I said, imagine that, <laughs> you know? Imagine that. And he said, not even the elders were all in agreement. Now, the reason he knows this is his father was an elder. He would know. And he said, but there were a couple elders that just couldn't let it go. And he mentioned specifically uh, Paul Brown and Mark Clark. He said, they just couldn't let it go. They felt like God was calling us and they were willing to get out in front and push a little bit and ask people to come along. So it wasn't just smooth sailing, but he said, we came together and we came together as one. And when we finished, everybody agreed, including those who were opposed at the beginning, that it was God's calling and they were doing what God had called them to do. And we're here 30 years later, experiencing the blessing of their walk on faith. And now it's our turn to walk out in faith and give to others for the next 30 years what was given to us 30 years ago. And so we believe that, that we have the work of God going here. Something special is going on here. We have a tremendous opportunity around us. And we believe that we have the capacity. We've been blessed to be able to do this right now. And so we're going to have a prayer meeting on Wednesday. And we ask all of you to come. We're just going to pray. We're going to pray about how we can Follow the lead that has been put before us by our elders that were appointed by God to build this. So as we talk about building together, you're going to get one of these on the way out. I'm going to say something about that in just a second. But I want to just share a couple of quick things in conclusion out of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is one of my favorite books. And the neat thing about Nehemiah is it's a building project. A building project that was ordained by God. And you might be thinking, well, why did Jerusalem need walls? I don't know. They never had another army, really. But, but for some reason, God wanted Nehemiah to go back and rebuild those walls. And he wanted to put life back in that city. Well, who would have guessed that one of the reasons for rebuilding Jerusalem is that about 400 And 50 or 60 or 70 years later, the Son of God would walk those very streets. Jesus would come to that town and walk on the streets of the city that that Nehemiah worked so hard to restore. You don't restore the inside till you restore the outside. He restored those walls. And don't you know, they just kept building that place up. And who would have guessed that that's where God was going to bring his son? And I don't know what God's planning here. But I believe with all my heart that if we take care of the facilities that we have and provide the ones that we need, that you will be faithful along with the Holy Spirit to carry out the mission of God in this church and in this community. And that's what we're hoping to do. And so a couple quick things here. The first thing that happens is Nehemiah in verse 4 of chapter 1 says, Well, I heard these words and I sat down and wept. And mourned for days, I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He got on his knees and prayed. We're asking you to come pray Wednesday night. If you can't come Wednesday, get on your knees at home and pray because we want God behind this. We don't want to try and do it on our own. And then 
it says in chapter 2, verse 5, that he told the king he was leaving. You need to understand that Nehemiah was the cupbearer of the king. He had a pretty cush job. He had a pretty comfortable place to live, but Nehemiah was willing to sacrifice comfort, safety, and security because Nehemiah felt the calling of God on his life. And it's going to take a sacrifice. And we're asking you to pray about how God might be calling you to help. When you get this brochure, there's different amounts on the back of it that you can pray about. And it breaks them down to to a total commitment, yearly commitment, monthly commitment, or weekly. So you can see what you can afford. Now, I want to be clear with you. We don't want you to give money you don't have. But I also want you to be faithful to pray to God and ask God what he wants you to give. Because it's going to take all of us being willing to give if we're going to make this happen. And then in chapter 3, and I love chapter 3. I remember as a young man, first time I read through this, that's the most boring chapter in the world. Because it lists all these people I don't know and just says they were up on the wall working. It finally dawned on me once when I started looking at this. Well, there's there's a message here. And it says right here in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, that the priests were out there working on the wall. And then he goes down a little further in verse 5 and says that the, nob- that the Tekoites were working, but the nobles refused. So not everybody did it. Not everybody did it. And then he goes on and, and he talks about all these different families. And I mean, there's dozens of them. And, and then the goldsmiths and the perfumers. I hadn't even thought about perfumers. But yeah, I guess the perfumers went out there and helped. And then he says that Next to him, next to uh, Makoja, the son of Haram. Next to him was Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the ruler of half the district of Jerusalem. And his daughters were there. So the women and the men all came together. They all went out there. And I tell you all that because we can't do this alone. And every little bit matters. And what we want more than anything else is for everybody to participate in whatever way you can. So I want you to be praying about that. Now, A.W. Tozer was a preacher, an um, evangelical preacher that was well-known by many people, read some of his books. He died in the 60s. But he said this, and this is really interesting. He said, if we pulled the Holy Spirit out of the church today, we would keep doing about 95% of what we're already doing anyhow, and nobody would notice the difference. I hope he's wrong, but that's what he said. He said, if you pulled the Holy Spirit out of the New Testament church, they would quit doing 95% of what they were doing, and everybody would notice the difference. And so I'm asking you to leave with this thought in your mind. Are you relying on the Holy Spirit and what you're doing in your life? Are you praying to God and asking him to direct you and asking him to show you how you can live like Jesus by loving and serving all? And are you willing to participate with this body, the body of Christ, of which you are individually members so that we can make a difference in this kingdom? You know, I want to praise God for what he's done in my life. Saved me. Gave me hope. Gave me a purpose. I praise God for what he's done in the life of this church for 130 years of which you're now a part. And I praise God for what he's going to do for the next 30 years. But for us to truly follow Jesus, it starts on our knees. Not in the flesh, but in the spirit. May God light the fire in our hearts.